All right. Happy Monday, everybody. I hope you guys had a good weekend and that you're ready for some more discussion about volcanoes and igneous rocks. Okay. So before we get started today, um, as you guys should know, the lecture quizzes on Blackboard, the really short ones, were due last night, Sunday night, 11.59 p.m., like all quizzes. Um, and basically all material from this point on will be due on Sunday nights. Okay. Um, if you didn't do the ones last night, just remember it's okay. This is just like an eye clicker quiz. Um, and uh, if you want to go back and complete them, I will just give you the credit anyway. Okay. So now for this coming Sunday, um, March 29th, several things will be due at 11.59 p.m. Okay. So the lecture quizzes, those short blackboard quizzes for my lectures, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday will be due, as well as reading quizzes from chapter four and five. And I've posted the PDFs of those chapters on blackboard, so you should be able to read them now. And then lab seven, you can download this morning, and it is a Google Earth exercise to explore volcanoes on Earth's surface. And you will access this through Blackboard and you will turn it in on Blackboard, okay? So that means you need to upload it as a Word doc or a PDF back into Blackboard. Do not email your TA, okay? Please read the directions of the lab very carefully, all of them. And um, I will also uh, post a, a video later this afternoon just showing some of the things about how to move around in Google Earth, if it's helpful, okay? And then I'll have the digital office hours on Microsoft Teams today and chime in um, if you have questions or if you just wanna test it out, okay? So just another thing before I get started, I would just like to remind you guys to please, please, please read the emails and documents that I send you. Now that um, I can no longer uh, see you guys face-to-face -face in the lecture hall, um, it's critically important that you read everything I send you. Um, and it does take me quite a bit of time to actually like write the emails and create these documents. And so um, it's not great when I get a lot of emails asking the same questions that would have been answered by just reading what I've already sent, okay? Several people have emailed me with questions that were answered in earlier emails and in the syllabus on Blackboard. So just please, before you sit down to write an email for me with a question, if it has something to do with the schedule or due date, check the syllabus and Blackboard. Okay, thanks. And then finally, because things are gonna be start being due at Sunday, around Sunday night at 11.59 p.m., this is a reminder that you need to manage your time wisely during the week, okay? Don't wait until 7 p.m. on Sunday to do all of the Geology 001 assignments for the week. You need to stay on it day to day, just like you are gonna be physically present here. Otherwise, you're gonna end up with too much work to do at the end, okay? I'm trying to make this as easy as and accessible for people during the whole week, but that really means you need to do stuff um, throughout the week, not on Sunday night, okay? I won't be very happy to get emails at around nine o'clock on a Sunday night asking for help, okay? Earlier in the week, that's fine. All right, the last time. Last time we were really focused on the reasons why magma melts. And there are three processes that allow the solid mantle to melt into a liquid. And the first and most important of these is decompression melting. Basically, this is that when you have earth materials under a lot of pressure, those molecules can't move about freely like they're in the liquid state. They have to remain packed as a solid, even if the temperature is hot enough to melt that material. You need to have low enough pressure so that those molecules can move freely in the liquid state. The other reason that magmas melt is due to the release of volatiles. So as earth materials are recycled back towards Earth's interior through plate tectonics, you have um, 
the reaction of volatiles that are being subducted back down towards the earth. Volatiles are things like gases or including water, carbon dioxide, um, sulfide gases, and volatiles literally do not like to stay in the solid state. Okay, they're volatile and they react with surrounding rocks and that reaction can break down rocks and cause them to turn into a melt. Okay, and then the other way that we cause melting is that uh, that way through heat transfer melting, where a volcano, or sorry, rising magma from deeper in the mantle um, comes up towards the crust and it's really hot and it begins to melt the crust around it. So it's basically just heat by conduction, melting by conduction, right? You put your hand on the side of a boiling pot of water and you're gonna burn your hand, right? So it's very similar if you have a really hot liquid that's coming up from the mantle and it starts to um, get pressed up against the solid cold crust, the crust is going to warm and melt. And then the other really important thing that we learned in last lecture is that the amount of silica in the melt determines the type of igneous rock that will form. And there's two end members based on the silica content. Remember silica is SiO2 and we have two ends of the spectrum with one being a felsic melt which is one which contains high percentages of silica, 66 to 76%. And then at the other end of the spectrum, we have mafic melts, which have a low amount of silica, 38 to 45%. And just as a mnemonic reminder for how to remember what the difference between felsic and mafic is, is that these are uh, portmanteaus of different words. So felsic, Fel for feldspar, which is a type of mineral, and sic for silica. And then mafic is magnesium for me, and thick, which is the Latin root for uh, iron, mafic, or for ferric, thick. So the mafic lavas have a lot of magnesium and iron in them with little silica versus felsic lavas, which have a lot of feldspar and silica, okay? And then to connect this back to something that you might interact with on a more daily basis or in real life is that we can think of melts in Earth's interior as like different recipes for cookies, right? If you change the amount of different ingredients in your cookie, you are going to end up with a different tasting cookie at the end, right? It also looks different, right? If you change the amount of flour in the cookie, if you change the uh, type of bonding agent where it's oil or butter or brown sugar, or if you change the temperature at which you um, cook your cookie, you're going to end up with something different, right? So you can think about that with igneous rocks and mafic melts, okay? So I haven't really answered the question, well, why, why do silica amounts in rocks melt uh, vary at all, right? That's, um, that's not really that clear. Here, I'm gonna turn off this video just for a second. Okay, so the reason we have different amounts of silicon melts is due to the source rock composition, right? So if you start out with something that has a high amount of silica in it and you melt it, you're gonna end up with a melt with more silica in it, okay? But then the other control on this is a process called partial melting. So different earth materials have different melting temperatures, right? And so as you change the melting temperature, you melt out certain minerals first, certain earth materials first, okay? So melts that have a relatively low temperature actually have a lot of silica in them because um, silica is stable at um, those lower temperatures. Whereas if you increase the melt temperature, you get a lower silica content, okay? So in this diagram here, it's showing how um, we rise, we decrease in the amount of silica with increasing temperature in your magma, okay? Why else does the amount of silica vary in a melt? Okay, so another way that this happens is through assimilation. So you have this hot molten magma that's 
traveling upward through uh, the upper part of the crust. And what it's doing is melting and reacting with surrounding rocks, and it assimilates the chemistry of those surrounding rocks into the melt. So that changes what the melt chemistry will be, and therefore the amount of silica in it. Okay, And this could be by just melting along a wall. This could be if a block of rock kind of falls off into the magma chamber and interacts with that um, hot magma that's rising up. And then finally, you can have magma mixing, right? You could have different bodies of magma that are gooping up like a lava lamp up through the mantle and towards the crust. And if they interact with each other and they have different chemistries, now they're going to combine into something different. Okay, so why does magma rise, all right? So magma rises because magma is buoyant, right? Magma is a liquid and therefore it is less dense than the surrounding solid rock. Less dense materials will float up on top of the more dense materials, just like oil on water. And then the other factor here is that magma is under pressure from the surrounding rock. So it's getting squeezed by the surrounding pressure of all this solid rock. And when it's squeezed, the liquid is going to go towards the path of least resistance, right? This is gross, but it's kind of like if you have a really big zit on your face and you put it under a lot of pressure, where does the liquid in the zit go? It goes out, okay? All right, so we, we've been talking about the liquid state of magmas and what affects them, but now let's think about what happens when magmas turn into rocks, right? So the most important thing here is the cooling rate. The cooling rate is basically how long it will take molten liquid magma to turn into an igneous rock. So what affects that rate? Well, the first thing is the volume and the surface area, which is basically just an expression of the shape. So if you have a relatively small volume of a magma, it's going to cool very quickly, right? Compared to a very large volume of magma. If you have a greater surface area, so one where the lava can cool off more quickly, such as like if it's in the shape of a pancake versus a tennis ball, that magma is going to cool more quickly, okay? So one way I would think about this is right is like if you experimented with different shapes of cake pans or baking dishes when you're making brownies. If you made brownies that uh, were a huge volume, you made a massive amount and you cooked it, rem remember like the middle is going to stay ooey gooey and molten for a lot longer than if you just cooked a really thin layer of brownies, okay? The other important consideration with cooling rates is whether you have an intrusive um, plutonic rock or an extrusive volcanic rock, right? And this tells you about the temperatures that this melt is now exposed to. So intrusive rocks are, you know, the ones that are forming below Earth's surface, Earth's surface and they're insulated. So their cooling rate is much, much slower when it's deep inside of the Earth. Right? because that heat can't escape. And the surrounding geothermal grate, the surrounding geothermal temperature is generally warmer. But if you have um, some like little sheet or intrusion that goes out away from the magma chamber, it's really thin, it's gonna cool really quickly because it's just a small volume, right? Okay, so that's the lower surface, but what about an extrusive rock, one that erupts on Earth's surface, okay? So, Magma, which turns into lava that erupts on Earth's surface, is going to cool very quickly, right? You go from over a thousand degrees centigrade to basically like maybe 10 degrees, maybe 30 degrees centigrade, less than, usually less than 50 degrees centigrade, right? That's a massive temperature difference. So what's going to happen is that lava is going to start cooling very quickly because it's in a really cold environment. The other factor to consider here is that when you have an eruption, that lava is flowing out over a volcano, but it's relatively thin. So it's going to cool very quickly. So again, with another, another food analogy here is think of what's going to cool faster, right? So you've got that brownie 
brownies that you made. And what if you just decide to turn off the oven and leave the brownies inside the oven? How are they going to cool? Right? They're going to cool very slowly because that temperature isn't going to isn't going to decrease very quickly because the heat is retained inside the oven. Okay? But what if you really want those brownies and you take them out of the oven and you want to cool them off quickly, so you take them outside and put them on your porch to make them freeze because it's still only like 25 freaking degrees in Burlington right now. Okay, they're going to cool really quickly. All right. So the cooling rate is really important for determining like how these melts will cool into a rock. So another thing that is important with melts and how they turn into rocks is what happens during that cooling process, right? And this is a process called fractional crystallization. And all this really means is that different minerals have different freezing points. So they form at different temperatures, okay? So you start out with a magma that's really hot and it starts to cool. And once it reaches 1400 degrees centigrade, mafic minerals, the ones that contain a lot of iron and magnesium, solidify first and fall out of the melt, right? Because they're solids. So what's left behind is a melt that is a totally different chemistry, right? And so as you keep cooling that melt, new minerals are going to keep forming and forming with lower and lower and lower melting or lower and lower freezing points until finally you reach the felsic minerals, silica and feldspars, which have uh, freezing temperatures of only about 800 degrees centigrade. Okay, so this process of fractional crystallization is important for understanding how a magma uh, chamber or a lava cools and forms different minerals. All right. So now that we've talked a little bit about how magma uh, or lavas cool and turn into rocks, we need to think about the differences again, right? So this is a review from the last slide is that igneous rocks can take on two broad categories, right? The first is extrusive or volcanic rocks, and those are the ones that form above or at the Earth's surface from the rapid cooling of lava. Think of this as Vulcan, who's the Roman god of fire. And then intrusive or plutonic rocks are those that form below Earth's surface through slow cooling of magma. And remember that plutonic, you can think of Pluto, who is the Roman god of the underworld, so beneath the surface. Okay. So these are the two different types of igneous rocks that form from cooled and solidified melts. And there's many different environments that these igneous rocks can form in, both extrusively and intrusively. And the environment under which they form, and the biggest control on that is whether it's intrusive or extrusive, is the cooling rate. And the cooling rate affects the size of the crystals that form, right? Fast cooling leads to little tiny crystals. Slow cooling leads to big, thick crystals. That affects the shape and morphology of the rocks that you end up with, right? If you just erupt out um, a lava and it quenches, you basically get glass and it shatters. But if you get something that cools deep underground for a long time and slowly, you end up with something that's like a solid homogeneous mass of granite. Okay, and then ultimately that controls the type of landscape that forms, right? So how, why do we have um, these incredible uh, granite valleys like Yellowstone, which is in plutonic igneous rock versus like the Hawaiian Islands, which are mafic volcanic rocks, okay? And then the magma chemistry is really important for the type of rock that forms. And in last class, we learned that we have felsic rocks, which are either gra granites or rhyolites, versus mafic rocks, which are gabbros or basalts. And then that chemistry also controls how lava behaves at Earth's surface in an extrusive environment. And so this 
week's lab, we are going to explore different volcanoes around the Earth to understand, um, you know, like why certain volcanoes look the way they do and why they have certain characteristics. So what I want you guys to do now in these following videos is to pay attention to what's coming out of these volcanoes. So this first one I'm going to show is from um, a volcano called Krakatoa in Indonesia. And let's, let's watch this, okay? All right, well, I want to start over. Okay, well, you can see the eruption going on here. There's a big cloud of ash that's coming out and it's flowing down the side of the mountain. And I think if we look closely in here, we'll actually see some big boulders that are coming out. Okay, I restarted this one. All right, sorry about that. Okay, so here's Krakatoa before it erupts, right? You can see some little gas clouds coming out, out of here, right? Boom! Okay, it ejects all this ash airborne, and then look at what's coming down. Boom, all these huge rocks, right? And it's kind of hard to even comprehend how big that rock is right there, but it is probably like the size of a building. <laughs> so this volcano is erupting huge fragments of rock and ash. And then the other thing you should pay attention to is that look at the slope of this mountain here, right? Oh, okay, look at the slope, right? This is really steep, the slope of the mountain on the side here. Okay, so important things to remember from this video, right, is that we have a volcano that erupts a lot of ash, big pieces of debris, some things like gigantic rocks, and it's from a really steep sided volcano. All right, now let's look at another video, this time of um, a fissure eruption from the Kilauea volcano in Hawaii, okay? So let's watch this video now, okay? Oh, all right, cool. Big lava curtain and fountain, right? And what's different about this? You aren't seeing the same massive amount of big rocks blowing out and ash. Instead, you get this perfectly uh, low viscosity lava that's flowing very quickly across the surface of the earth, okay? You can see it moving very quick, very quickly downhill here, right? Here's the lava flow further down the coast, right? And also pay attention, this is like a pretty flat area, right? There's not a really steep slope. That's really different from the previous video, right? There isn't that characteristic volcano cone shape. Instead, this is really a flat landscape. Okay? But you can still see some of this lava is flowing downhill slowly, right? All that orange color means it's still liquid. All right. And it looks like it destroyed the highway here. And I'm going to skip forward, get to the good stuff near the ocean. Okay. All right. So this lava is still going all the way. All right. And then that lava that started out from that initial eruption site has flowed out all the way over this relatively low gradient landscape and is now entering the sea. And what you're seeing with all the steam is the rapid cooling of lava into the ocean, okay? All right, so we had two really different volcanoes here, right? 
So I'm once again going to ask you guys to think about pancakes to understand geology, specifically to understand why different volcanoes have different shapes. Okay, so the key here is we're going to think about viscosity. All right, so viscosity is the ability of a substance to resist flow. Right, so that means that something with low viscosity is runny and flows easily. It does not resist flow. Something with high viscosity is sticky and does not flow easily. So here's the pancake example, all right? So if you're making pancake batter, right, and you add too much milk, you make really runny peanut batter, pancake batter, and it spreads out into really thin pancakes. But if you add more flour to your batter, right, then it's all sticky. It's not very vis it's very viscous, and it doesn't spread out very much when you put it on the griddle or in a pan. Okay, it's more of a mound shape. All right. So how does this relate to volcanoes? All right. So there are several factors that affect the viscosity of lavas. Right. Okay. So the first one is temperature. Hotter magmas are less viscous. And this is very similar to when you put maple syrup in the microwave, right? If you put the, micro, the maple syrup in the microwave for a minute and you take it out and then you pour it, on, pour it out, right? It's gonna flow very quickly. But if you put the maple syrup in the fridge for like an hour or so, it's gonna get all cold and then it's slow and sticky and viscous, right? So the temperature of the lava that is erupting out of a volcano, if it's really, really hot, it's going to flow more easily and be less viscous. If it's a relatively cool lava, it's going to be more sticky. Okay. Another factor controlling the viscosity of lavas is their um, volatile content. And remember, volatiles uh, encourage melting, right? They break down the chemical bonds in the surrounding rock. And so that makes the lava less viscous if you have more gases dissolved into it. And then finally, and this is the most important factor, is the silica content, okay? So the silica content tells, has a strong control on the viscosity where mafic lava, those that have a lot of magnesium and iron bearing minerals, are much less viscous, right? This is like pancake batter with too much milk in it. Whereas felsic lava, where you have all that silica, the silica bonds are really strong, it's more viscous and it flows really stickily, okay? So let's look at these two couple of diagrams, right? So up here, I'm showing how the viscosity, which is the sort of mobility of the lava, decreases with decreasing temperature as well as the increasing silica content, right? So these are the felsic lavas like rhyolite, high silica content, it's colder, right? And so you have more of a mound shaped lava versus a basalt, which is a mafic lava, and it has a lower amount of silica and a higher temperature, and it's more runny and thin. Okay, so how is that expressed in the sort of landscape scale, right? Is that when you have a basaltic lava, it flows out e easily across the landscape very quickly, right? So basaltic flow, it's gonna go a far distance versus if you have something with a little more silica in it and andesite, right? It's going to still flow down over the landscape, but it's a little bit more sticky and it starts to form up more of a more of a mound shaped um, land feature versus if you have a, a high silica content lava eruption it's really sticky and it doesn't flow very far and so what you end up with is more of a cone shape right it's more of a mound all right so this viscosity control on lava is really important for the types of volcanoes that we see around the world. So it's hard to really grasp just how big some volcanoes are relative to each other because 
a lot of times humans um, more easily understand changes in elevation, right? So you go to Washington State and you see Mount Rainier or Mount St. Helens and you're like, wow, that's a really tall mountain that rises up quickly. Well, that type of volcano like Mount Rainier or Mount St. Helens is actually quite small compared to the larger volcanoes like in Hawaii, which are of almost similar elevation, up to 14,000 feet above sea level, but they're much wider, right? So in panel A here, I'm showing um, the Mauna Loa Hawaiian volcano, right? And see how much wider and broad and gently sloped this volcano is compared to Mount Rainier, which is pretty narrow and has a steeper slope, okay? And so now you can think about, well, what type of lava must have erupted here to form these different types of volcanoes, right? So the broader, more um, gently sloped uh, volcano in Hawaii is a shield volcano that erupted a mafic hot lava versus the composite cone or stratovolcano, Mount Rainier, which probably erupted um, some combination of felsic and intermediate lavas that flowed really sticky down the sides of it. Okay. All right, so for the assignment this week um, for the lab, there's a couple of really important things that you need to know. All right, and we'll cover more throughout the week, but you can at least figure out the size of these volcanoes, right? And determine what they are. So the first one you need to know about is a shield volcano. A shield volcano is make up the largest volcanoes on Earth, and they're characterized by very broad, wide areas with gentle slopes that erupt primarily basalt, so a mafic hot lava. And they usually erupt from some central vent or caldera and sometimes have uh, small vents that come up around the edges. So Kilauea is an example of a flank or uh, vent off the side of the main Mauna Loa volcano, which is the big island of Hawaii, right? And we can see that Mauna Loa itself is a much wider volcano than uh, volcanoes that we know like Mount St. Helens or Mount Rainier on, in the Pacific Northwest, okay? So Mauna Loa is a massive volcano, right? That's out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, right? And in terms of height, it is from the base of it on the ocean floor to where it peaks out uh, in the atmosphere, it's actually taller than um, Mount Everest, but it is not the largest volcano on Earth. And the largest volcano on Earth hasn't reached um, the surface of the ocean quite yet. Um, to the same extent that Mauna Loa has. But in the South Pacific, there's a giant, giant shield volcano called the Tamu Massif. And we can get an idea of just how big Tamu Massif is based on the scale here, right? This is 200 kilometers to cover this massive land area versus here's the Mauna Loa volcano, and this is only 80 kilometers. Okay. So on the other end of the spectrum here is the stratovolcanoes or composite volcanoes. So stratovolcanoes like this one, Mount Discovery in Antarctica, which I know all too well because I slept on it for a long time, has a generally steeper slopes. It has a greater silica content, meaning those lavas are uh, more viscous and they form through the alternating eruption of lava flows as well as ash that has erupted and then lands on the surrounding landscape, okay? So if you take a cross section of a stratovolcano, they have layers, right? It's like ogres, they have layers. So it's inner, so these like um, interbedded layers of lava that erupted and flowed over the sides as well as ash and pyroclastics, which are things that erupt in, out into the atmosphere and land nearby. And so, we always think of stratovolcanoes as being sort of this like ideal looking shape. It's a perfect, you know, tall, pointy looking mountain with layers on the inside. But in reality, 
these stratovolcanoes are really complex on, in their interior with many different pathways for magma to erupt out as lava and um, they evolve through time. But the important consideration here with a stratovolcano is that they have a greater silica content, which makes the lava more sticky, okay? And more gas and ash comes out of these stratovolcanoes than a shield volcano, okay? So here's just some cool pictures of stratovolcanoes around the world, right? So the really famous ones are often the ones that a lot of big human settlements are around. So um, like these crazy volcanoes in Chile that create insane volcanic lightning when they erupt, Mount Etna in um, Italy on the island of Sicily, Mount Nungaroi, which is Mount Doom in Lord of the Rings in New Zealand, uh, Mount Erebus, which is the southernmost active volcano on Earth. It's maybe covered in glacier ice, but there's actually an active lava lake in the middle of it. And then um, Mount Rainier, which is probably the, the most famous uh, stratovolcano in the United States, which, which uh, is the backdrop for uh, Seattle, Washington. Okay, so hopefully that gave you enough background info to get started with Google Earth and at least recognize the broad differences between stratovolcanoes and shield volcanoes. Okay.